about the fight for talent and resources and its impact on readiness. We are happy to have as our moderator for the panel, Major General Sarah Zabel, the Vice Director of DISA, as the moderator. As Vice Director at DISA, General Zabel helps to lead a global organization. We all understand DISA and its demands with a diverse set of workforce, military, civilian, and contract personnel who help to do a variety of things from planning and developing and delivering uh, joint interoperable command and control capabilities to putting that infrastructure in place globally in direct support of the variety from the President down to, to our, our mission partners and our war fighters on the point. Behind her current duties, duties, her experience in two combatant commands on the Joint Staff and on the Air Staff, uh, along with duties with the National Security Agency, are excellent qualifications for our discussions and, and her moderation of this panel. General Zabel uh, has been announced and soon will move into the IT acquisition space for the Air Force, her leadership recognized yet again. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome for General Zabel and this morning's panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's good to see you all, you all out here. Um, so today we are going to talk about people, about talent, about finding it, bringing it in, um, using it well, cultivating it over the long term. So we have a great panel here. They come from a lot of diverse um, backgrounds. And what I want to do is I want to introduce them one at a time. And then I'm at, I've asked them to speak very briefly about what their role is, you know, what's their context with respect to, to people and talent, um, and also to describe one of the challenges that they see in this area. So let me start with Alan Powler, who is right next to me, the founder of the Sands Institute. Alan Powler is the president for Sands Technology Institute and director of research for the Sands Institute. In 2001, the president named Allen as one of the original members of the National Infrastructure Assurance Council. In 2005, the federal CIO council chose him as, his, as its annual Azimuth Award winner, recognizing his singular vision and outstanding service to government information technology. Allen? Uh, thanks, Sarah. The, the um, opening is, is easy because I'm just going to name the four questions I'm going to answer later. So. Um, we, the SANS, most of you know, is the principal training organization for the U.S. and its allies. We do about 37,000 people a year. We also are a degree-granting institution. Um, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. About six years ago, we did a panel with the Secretary of Homeland Security about how Homeland Security could compete for talent. And it, had, it was a blue-ribbon kind of panel. I was honored to be anywhere near them. But the answer was you can't that you don't have any interesting jobs that will compete with NSA and the other cool jobs. You're not going to get them. Stop trying. If you really want to, though, and it matters, then you're going to have to fix the national pipeline problem. And they came out with some proposals on that. Nobody could do that. The national pipeline problem is really hard. Turns out that, that over the last year, several other countries have been trying to do that, too. And I'm going to tell you four quick stories that will answer the four questions that were asked by that panel, which were, um, how do we find the people with the aptitude to succeed? How do we actually know in advance whether they're going to do well? Um, what is, why do so, this was actually the biggest one, by the way. Why do so many people go into training for cybersecurity and come out able to talk about it, to admire it, but if you stick them in front of a machine, they don't have a clue what to do? Have you noticed that? At least 80% of the people getting degrees are really good at talking about. Third one is, what's the key to providing persistent training with lifelike exercises, 24 by 7 availability, deployed on a ship anywhere there's a military network? Is that really possible? And the answer turns out, I think so. And finally, can we find a way to motivate young people and train them and differentiate the ones who are going to succeed early so we can invest in them early? So those are the four questions I'll answer later. Back to Sarah. Okay, thank you. Um, our next panelist is Colonel Jeff Collins, who is the director of Air Force CyberWorks. Colonel Jeffrey Collins directs the Air Force CyberWorks, a new venture comprising a public-private research and design center located at the Air Force Academy, focused on cyber capabilities and disruptive technology. He leads a small team for the Air Force that melds military, academic, and industry expertise with state-of-the-art technology and user-centered de design to solve wicked operational pro problems. Colonel Collins was previously the Deputy Director for Air Force Cyberspace Strategy and Policy at the Pentagon. He is the former Research and Technology Director of the Command and Control Battle Lab and commanded the 766th and 966th Air Expeditionary Squadrons in Afghanistan. 
Colonel Collins has degrees from Purdue, Rensselaer Pol Polytechnic Institute, and his PhD is from Carnegie Mellon University. Go ahead, Jeff. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, talking about hashtag AF CyberWorks, uh, uh, we, as you mentioned, we deliver fast answers to wicked operational problems uh, for Air Force missions, and I emphasize uh, operational problems because although our name is Cyber, uh, works is the second part of that name, and that verb is important because cyber has infused every one of the Air Force Corps missions and any mission that needs to be accomplished. Um, success in delivering answers quickly requires a cognitive diversity of teams, and so we partner our digital native cadets with industry partners, with cyber operators, with mission experts, uh, and we do what we call design sprints, which are one week uh, um, using a technique called design thinking. If you're not familiar with design thinking, you'll want to Google it uh, to, uh, to get out there or Bing it to uh, get out there and um, get with the field and how we're moving quickly. Uh, those design sprints are weak and they're designed not to articulate the problem or admire the problem, but to design a solution that we then give back to the Air Force. So that design thinking process involves rapid prototyping, it's user-centered design, and really key is uh, that you fail a lot during a design <laughs> thinking sprint so that you can succeed at the end. You can find out rapidly what doesn't work so that you know the way to recommend going forward. Now the Air Force located this CyberWorks unit at the Air Force Academy uh, um, because the thinking was we could take more risks uh, being an academic environment. Um, it's also the cradle of the Air Force in our culture and so the ability to affect the long-term culture, and especially as it regards risk, risk aversion is one of the challenges that we face in workforce development and, and across mm -hmm. uh, the DOD. And then finally, it infuses project-based learning into the cadets' curriculum. And so the cadets are focused on delivering answers rather than articulating problems, mm -hmm. and they bring in a whole host of different uh, perspectives and different academic fields to the, uh, answering those problems. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, ma'am. All right, our next panelist is Rear Admiral Timothy White, commander of the Cyber National Mission Force. Admiral White is a graduate of the United States Naval Academy. He holds a Master of Science in Systems Technology, Command Control and Communications from the Naval Postgraduate School, and a Master of Science in National Resource Strategy from the Industrial Colleges, College of the Armed Forces. He was originally a surface warfare officer, and then he served on the USS Missouri as electronic warfare officer, combat information center officer, and assistant operations officer. He was selected for redesignation as a cryptologist, now cryptologic warfare officer, in 1992. Admiral White has served on operational fleet tours as assistant cryptologist, commander, U.S. Naval Forces Central Command, and assistant chief of staff for information operations embarked on USS Blue Ridge. His command tours included the Naval Security Group activity in Bahrain and Navy Information Operations Command, Maryland. Uh, his flag tours include Deputy Director Taylor, Tailored Access Operations at NSA and as Director for Intelligence, United States Pacific Command. Admiral White, thank you. Hey, ma'am, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be with you uh, this morning and to talk about such a imperative for us, which is talent, uh, the way we identify it, recruit it, retain it, incentivize it, nurture it, uh, and that is all a challenge. Uh, I am blessed with being uh, the commander of a wholly owned subsidiary uh, inside U.S. Cyber Command. Uh, we are an operational entity, so my day-to-day -day challenge is how do I take the talent that I have and mission them to the task which has been assigned to us by uh, my commander via the Department of Defense. Um, those forces come uh, through a mechanism that the services all have to recruit and train soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and civilians. Uh, we benefit from also having a very robust contractor workforce. So somewhere in all of that, you should see um, challenges, opportunities, frictions, uh, misunderstandings, misperceptions, and all of them, I think, together with industry, uh, we could probably reduce um, those things that vex us and improve those things that enable us. Um, I um, recognize that uh, I'm bracketed on my left and right by uh, professional educators and very experienced, uh, highly educated folks uh, they are in the problem solution business, and one of the things that we need to do more of, I think, is uh, join arm in arm uh, with them, whether it comes out of private institutions, government institutions, purely academic institutions, and so on. So I think that's a great way to go. Uh, I was struck by the notion of the digital native, right? The vast majority of my workforce is under the age of 25. 
um, less than half my age. <laughs> Uh, that, that bothers me uh, every day, but that's the way it is. It's, you know, so I have a communication problem with my workforce to a degree, uh, simply as a function as a generational challenge. Um, but I, I don't know that they are necessarily digital natives as much as they are app natives. And so one of the challenges I think we do have, uh, and Mr. Pallard talked about this, a lot of people come with education pedigrees, uh, but actually being able to get onto mission and to do uh, things in cyberspace, um, whatever they may be, operate, defend, and so on. Uh, that's an increasing imperative for us. And that is the kind of talent challenge that we have, is to really peel back the hood uh, on the people that we have and figure out what motivates them and how do we incentivize them, but how do we make sure uh, that they are given the skills so that we can mission them effectively and properly. So thanks for that. All right, thank you. All right, our next panelist is uh, Rear Admiral Retired Jan Hamby. Uh, she is the Chancellor of the College of Information and Cyberspace in the National Defense University. She retired from the Navy in, tw in 2012 after a long and illustrious career. Uh, she was commissioned in 1980. She has three master's degrees in Information Systems Management, Business Administration, and National Security Strategy. She served as an Assistant Professor of Computer Sciences at the United States Military Academy. She was assigned to the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower as part of the initial assignment of women to naval combatants and participated in Eisenhower's deployment to Haiti in support of Operation Uphold Democracy. She served in more roles afloat and ashore than I can name in just this intro. Uh, she was, one of her roles was the Vice Director for C4 Systems, or the J6, on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and as a Deputy Chief Information Officer, um, from which she retired from the OSD in 2012. So I guess as a chancellor, you are one of the people who's responsible for producing the people who can talk about cybersecurity, is that correct? That is correct. I would like to say that our program does a little bit more than that, but we aren't training the folks who are actually sitting at the keyboards doing the defense. We are educating the future leaders of the force, both the cyber force as well as the traditional kinetic force. So the College of Information and Cyberspace used to be known as the Information Resources Management College, but the curriculum has evolved and it has grown and it is really focused across the spectrum of educational needs that we need in the cyber domain. Most importantly, to include those who are operating from the platform or leveraging the platform to create the effects out in the kinetic world that are required by our campaign plans. So the, the college's mission has expanded. We educate and prepare national security leaders, primarily from the Department of Defense, but also from our interagency partners and from multinational partners so that they can lead in this domain. And let's not be kidded, everyone is in this domain in some way. So our program is meeting a very, very real need. The challenge that I see is twofold. One, I have a very real tactical challenge within my college to make sure that that curriculum continues to evolve to meet the exact need that it needs to be needing, meeting, and to have the faculty on board that has the agility and ability to deal with the futures of this domain to keep the curriculum up to speed. I'm, I feel like we're succeeding pretty well on that right at the moment, except for capacity issues. And the other challenge that I have is getting the right students into our programs. We have a unique problem in this domain. The folks who are actually conducting the operations, planning the campaigns, sitting at the keyboards, are in such demand that we are finding that the operational tempo is driving our leadership to say no when they have an opportunity to go and get some advanced education. And I don't blame the mission commanders for this. I really don't, TJ. A really <laughs> little bit, a little bit. They've got to get the mission done. You know, there are times when you have to eat your seed corn in order to survive. The challenge we face collectively is how do we generate some white space in the operational tempo of these folks so that we can get them into these programs that will be preparing them, not for the job they're in right now, but for the next three jobs that they will be in, so that they can take the leadership mantle of our forces in the future. All right, thank you. 
Hi, Karen. Glad you made it. (laughs) All right. Our final panel member is Karen Evans. She's the director of U.S. Cyber Challenge. Karen Evans, uh, Cyber Challenge is the nationwide talent search and skills development program focused specifically on the cyber workforce. Karen retired from the federal government after nearly 28 years of government service. She started as a GS2 and worked her way to the administrator for e-government and information technology at the Office of Management and Budget within the executive office of the president. She oversaw the federal IT budget of nearly $71 billion, which included implementation of IT throughout the federal government. Prior to becoming the administrator, Ms. Evans was the chief information officer for the Department of Energy. There, she was responsible for the design, implementation, and continuing successful operation of IT programs and initiatives throughout the department and its offices. Okay. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the U.S. Cyber Challenge, uh, and I think it's nice that I'm bookended with Alan, because uh, really what we do is uh, the idea, we were funded initially through the Federal CIO Council, as well as a cooperative agreement from Department of Homeland Security, as well as private sector. And the idea was is that we could find different tools that would attract people in and help grow the aperture while everybody else is figuring out all these other activities that need to be done. Because there is a short-term, mid-term, and a long-term need for these types of people that have the set of skills. And so you're not necessarily going to get the defenders of today from the traditional STEM programs, but there's a lot of people who have capability, who can do this work, who have education in other fields that can start and then work their way through the education and the training and those types of things. So the U.S. Cyber Challenge does hold online competitions. We, un- we identify people with capabilities and based on their performance, they get an invitation, they earn an invitation to a camp. Our camp season's getting ready to start. That camp is run like a boot camp. So we make them drink from a fire hose. They, the SANS participates in the training, so do several other industry experts. So does the FBI Secret Service. We run um, a job fair. We run resume writing, interview uh, tactics, uh, ethics. And then at the end of the week, we run a capture the flag competition. And we do not allow them to pick their teams, which really gets them upset. And we tell them the reason why is because you compete as individuals for a job, but you're assigned to a team to work for performance. So we pick their teams. Then at the end of that, what we do is we also have for ongoing activities, we have built out a social networking platform for them to continue their engagement. And so that is called cybercompx.org, where we have mapped all the competitions that are available across the United States to the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. And this portal provides a series of tools that match up employers with people who have demonstrated what they said from their resume, their education, but actual performance as well. So we are taking the data that they do from the competitions and then you can marry it up. So if a person says that I'm an expert in X, Y, and Z, you can actually see the performance that they did. So the you should think of us as a, as a think tank and that when we uh, come up with a set of tools that have a repeatable performance that comes out of those, we move those over into a commercial platform where we're partnered with Amazon Web Services and Monster.com. So just a real quick example, if uh, U.S. Cyber Command was looking for people with specific uh, talents in, say, forensics analysis, they could search for forensics analysis on Cyber Compacts, see all the competitions, then issue out a note to people on the platform and say we're interested in all the people that have played in these competitions. And then if we have data exchange partnerships with them, they'll be able to see actually the individual's performance in a team competition based on what they've done on certain types of activities that were included in that competition. So it's now given the ability to drill down. Thank you. He was spilling water all over himself in case anybody and you missed that. To bring okay. That. Oh, yes. I thought thank it was you. Karen. Cut it off. <laughs> cut it yes. off. <laughs> all right. So thank you. Now, what I want to do is let's first of all talk about um, identifying and bringing in talent. Okay. So we have seen so many changes in technology in our world in recent years, 
And it's not just linear change. I mean, we see, uh, so one year a chip is this fast, the next year is much faster, much faster, and we know it'll continue to be faster and faster into the future. But we also see a qualitative change. So, um, Jeff, you mentioned, you used Googled as a verb. That didn't used to be a verb very long ago. In fact, and you remember Google was a search engine, but if you consider that Google became so much more than a search engine, the, the emergent properties of what it was able to do. So now it's, it's, it is still a search engine, but it's also marketing, mapping, I mean, just any controlling our lives, perhaps. Um, and that's an emergent property and something that you really don't predict. Social media, we've seen it appear, grow, be weaponized against us. You, we try to use it to, you know, for, um, for national security. These are indications of um, technology is not only changing, but the, our, the entire environment in which we want to hire this talent changes. So given that, given that degree of unknown change in the future, what are the indicators you look for? Um, I'm gonna target Jeff for this first one. Um, what are the indicators you look for in identifying talent that you want to bring in? Well, ma'am, uh, you know, our former boss, General Bender, used to talk about us being the greatest Air Force of the machine age, and we'll see about the digital age, right? <laughs> that, the, that sort of change of war fighting, the change of the overall uh, landscape. Two constants, however, are you're going to look for people who are creative yeah. and have agility. Now, the Air Force, uh, we did go out and along with the University of Maryland and Castle, we studied the particular skills that um, separate great cyber operators from, uh, from the average, uh, in particular with a focus of how do we um, increase the success rates by scaffolding those who may need the help, and also how can we um, recruit better. And so there are some findings on that, but, but those skills seem to me, as I think you're suggesting, mm -hmm. that, that those particulars uh, may be fungible. But what's not, and what is going to be true in every situation, is the ability to abstract from details uh, an um, operational picture that allows you to know the right thing to do, to, to uh, not, not get sucked down into um, to the, the details, but instead to apply your creativity, your agility to any situation. And, and we talk sometimes about moving from a chess situation to a go situation in cyber, where um, it, it's not so much a uh, overall win and lose, but, you know, a board, um, you know, how, uh, the, the players change, the situation changes. Um, I think the challenge uh, for us, and, and uh, I was in New York last week and happened to talk to a Columbia graduate student mm -hmm. who had been accepted for an internship at a government agency uh, for this summer. Uh, well, it turns out that government agency didn't get the paperwork done in time, couldn't get the paperwork done in time. So instead, this Columbia graduate student is going to go um, work for private industry, uh, which I'm happy about as an American. You know, uh, she's interested in cyber. Uh, she's, I'm sure, very smart. Um, but what's her first interaction with the government? Mm -hmm. Is it good? Probably not, if that's an <laughs> indication. Um, so. We lose out on it, and maybe she was a terrible person and we're better off without her, but <laughs> okay. we, we uh, I mean, I don't know, right? <laughs> but but um, we lost that opportunity to find out, yeah. and we also lost the opportunity to make an impact on that individual that no matter what she goes off and does, she would have the government perspective in the future. And then, uh, you know, the other question is, is service in the government and our reputation attractive to those creative, agile people who want to innovate? Um, I'd suggest that the answer is probably no, although, you know, standing up organizations like CyberWorks, um, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to overcome that, right? We're, we're trying to cut through that. Um, so at, at least for the Air Force, the Air Force Recruiting Service has recognized that those first interactions yeah. are very important. So, you know, taking a more data-based approach, uh, taking an approach where, um, you're trying to find the right people and you're trying to reach a di diverse range of people, but also um, identifying talent and then being able to cross the lines. So we've set up a cell at our Air Force Personnel Center, for example, that's a cyber cell that isn't just, you know, uh, military, but also um, if, you're, if the military is not right for you, we can just cross lines 
to civilians. Maybe we could overcome if that Columbia student had been in the Air Force example, maybe that cyber cell could get through the paperwork faster to enable that. So, so thinking of it as a, as a digital problem of how we attract those skills and how we um, first uh, touch, first convey ourselves to that um, awesome talent that's out there uh, needs to continue to be a focus. And, um, you know, at the Air Force Academy, we continue to get the, the great uh, students coming into the Air Force Academy. And part of what CyberWorks does is we reach across majors so that it's not just we do great training for the keyboard sitting uh, cyber operators, uh, but we also want any AFSC, any, um, any officer who is going into any AFSC to understand how cyber interacts in that space. And so we're, we're thinking through how do we do those touch points with people who may not know that they should be interested in cyber. Okay. A anybody else in thoughts? Um, so I'm struck by a couple things. Uh, I, I too think that, uh, you know, first impressions count and uh, we all ought to be concerned about lost opportunities. That's as, uh, as much of an interest to a going concern in the private sector as it would be for uh, any segment of government uh, in the defense or the national security enterprise. Uh, I wonder if a mechanism like U.S. Cyber Challenge, one of the mm -hmm. things could be adapted would be, um, you know, a lot of our talents self-identify, which I'll return to in a moment, but as part of the Cyber Challenge, maybe we could get them into the personnel system a little bit easier. Well, right. <laughs> and, and maybe, uh, you know, just identify them so that they can start paperwork issues and processes for, for you know, some sort of entry-level clearance so they can be, you know, plug socket, uh, you know, for the government. And then, and just a couple other thoughts. Um, it's not just operators on keyboard, right? Uh, you know, that counts, and that gets a lot of press, and that gets a lot of attention, and it should get a lot of attention. Um, but one of the things I think we've learned, particularly as part of the security uh, enterprise for the nation, in the DOD in particular, is, um, you know, processes count, structure counts, method counts, uh, a sense of confidence, both in the chain of command and performance across the mission space count. Uh, and all of that operational, you know, very far forward uh, that we do uh, and are prepared to do uh, as a function of readiness, mm -hmm. all of that is underpinned and backstopped by a whole bunch of, uh, of expert talent uh, in the analytic uh, and the production regime that you just don't hear about a lot. And uh, so it is about analysts, it is about linguists, mm -hmm. it is uh, not just about coders and engineers and uh, operators. So uh, there is a whole bunch of that that goes on as well. Okay. So I'd like to address a few things. Um, first and foremost, I, wa I was struck by your comment about you thought their attraction to the government would be no. I'm, gonna, I'm here to dispel that because I travel all around the country with this. Um, the attraction to the government is really high. I would agree with your second point that the process with the government is difficult for them to understand. And so that is one thing that we are attempting to do with Cyber Complex is kind of bridge that translation of, because if they search USA Jobs and look, that there isn't a correlation between cybersecurity, information assurance, and parentheticals on position descriptions, right? I mean, that's how it's all set up right now. So what we are working on is trying to bridge that. The other part is, is that a lot of the folks that you would want to get when they're green, because they're not, what did you say, they're not digital natives, that they're app? natives yeah that's really true okay and there's a lot of information that they have out there that they probably should never have put out there and so we really do try to get to them ahead of time especially through the ethics panel that we're running is is that you know it may be fun this weekend to take this picture and post this type of stuff but it's going to come back and haunt you and i can tell you that i have worked with several of the folks that have come through the u.s cyber challenge because now they've taken the ethics so close to heart that they have said everything on the clearance forms, right? They have disclosed everything, which then when they disclose everything, they have to go back and make restitution. And I'll give you an example. There's one person who did internships, did all this great stuff at DHS, and then disclosed that he hacked into the online school uh, book store and had downloaded some books for free while he was in college. And DHS folks said, okay, you know, like, you got to go make restitution. And he's like, 
okay, they don't even know I did this, and now I have to figure <laughs> out who actually did this. And so it kind of, it kind of like you really want this person who's thought about this. Maybe that wasn't the right application of their talent. So, so there is this that we are trying to bridge that to bring them in. The other part that you talked about was the mission roles, and Alan talked about um, the Blue Ribbon Commission that DHS did. So some of the research that we have done, um, and we reached out to experts across the nation, is we have developed critical mission controls, roles, and responsibilities with industry experts across the board. This information is publicly available. And we developed a competition around, for example, incident response. And we've been running that competition to make sure that we get repeatable uh, you know, results and things like that so that we can then deploy it even further. So um, you can do it. You can have the attributes of what people say will be those critical skills, and now you can develop tools that could measure people's ability to perform when they go forward. What you do with that is now the next step. Well, okay. well Karen, yeah, so before you do, the, wait, I just gotta, I gotta know, um, what do you tell people who are considering how much do I, um, do I disclose? Uh, yes. Do we have a don't ask, don't tell policy for applicants for their hacking? Um, well, master. what I ended up doing was he reached out to me because he said, I really want to serve the nation. You know, he came through the camps because uh, this be, it's very, this whole group of folks are really highly competitive. So we have tapped into that competitive nature. Uh, I wrote a letter and said, look, this is exactly what you want. This is the person, these guys, you know, want to come in and do the work. Um, you, you should consider some of, you know, reciprocity types of things, maybe a waiver, maybe a temporary type of thing, because this is the type of talent that we're reaching out to, and, you know, maybe not necessarily put him on some really critical types of projects, but let him prove his worth through demonstrated work. Um, so I wrote a two-page memo on that, and I'm happy to say right now, he hasn't been totally rejected. It's still pending, which means they're hey. thinking about it. They are thinking about that we've made a good argument over it. Okay. And let's hope he doesn't go elsewhere <laughs> while we're thinking about yeah. it. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so I, ju I just want to clarify, uh, so the, the, absolutely right. I am the, the beneficiary every day of um, young people who want to serve right. uh, in government. My, my point was that there is a... Uh, a set of creative, agile, um, forward-thinking young people that are not currently attracted to um, government service. They, they absolutely do well in cyber competitions. They, they uh, you know, absolutely are the best among the country. But when they look at where they think they can make an impact, when they're comparing Silicon Valley to the Air Force Academy or government service, uh, um, I'm suggesting we can put a better uh, face forward. Um, on how we can be innovative. Well, I would argue I that Silicon point. Valley is not your competitor. It's critical infrastructure is your competitor for the yeah. this talent. It's it's because the type of work that you can do, they can do it and get hired faster like in the financial sector or in the energy grid. So it isn't necessarily inventing new technologies because they want to find things. It's critical infrastructure that is a big competitor. Alan, you probably have seen some of that too. I, I actually want to add a, another dimension. We, we're not the only country worried about this. The UAE was getting hacked just mm -hmm. all over the place. They decided to build a, a, an NSA agency of their own. After they succeeded, I'll tell you what, they found something fascinating, but after they succeeded, they decided that they wanted Emiratis in it. There aren't all that many Emiratis in the UAE. Um, and so they wanted to get all of the kids engaged in this, not just a few. And so they took the camp idea and went back upstream and created a game that allows anyone in their home to take on challenges in cyber, to learn how to solve the challenges, to do it on their own, to show persistence, to show capabilities, and then the best of those kids get to go to camps like Karen's camps. And they have 4,600 kids going through the, the online program. They had 600 kids at the camps last summer. They had the top 50 going to a national competition, and two of them have skipped college and gone directly into the agency, and they're, and they're 
creating a whole pipeline. So I love the idea of camps, but not necessarily camps for kids who've already proven they're good, but something that reaches further out. And just yesterday, the governor of Virginia announced at the National Governors Association that seven states were going to release that UAE game to the kids in their states so that they could develop the cyber talent in their states. So it's, it's a beginning of the US learning from other countries rather than thinking we're smarter than everybody all the time. I may have the wrong book, but that sounds a lot like Ender's Game, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This could be a very interesting future. <laughs> and in the question of what are the indicators that help us identify which of the talent out there we really mm -hmm. want to bring on board, yeah. the future is what I am most concerned about because I see a lot of recruitment being focused at the skills we need today. Right. Or the skills that we needed when we were stuck on this notion of defense in depth as mm -hmm. the way that we provide information assurance. And boy, that scares me. Because the future that I see for us being effective in providing a level of security to our own operations out there is not about defense in depth. It's about resiliency. It is about getting away from a scarcity mentality that you've got to nurse along old systems because you won't be able to buy new ones. It's got to get us away from this notion that you must do things a certain lockstep way. It's that agility piece that Jeff talked about. So if we don't talk about the indicators that tell us that the talent has that potential to grow and change with us and to see the future, then I think we're going to get this one wrong. So I'm going to go back to you, Jeff, <laughs> because you're working there at the Air Force Academy with the CyberWorks, and you get to see some of these youngsters up close and personal. What kinds of behaviors or what kinds of indications do you see that you'd be able to identify the best talent for the future that we're facing in this domain? Um, so, uh, you know, when you referenced Orson Scott Card, uh, yeah. uh, you know, in Ender's Game, and, and there is a just no getting around, um, the level of reading is associated with the level of creativity that a young person has done. Um, you know, being an app culture may be in contrast to that, and, and you know, the next generation, Generation Z, I'm sure will will have different indicators. But when you find a student no matter what their major is, who has read a lot, who, ha who is um, interested in almost anything that you put in front of them, and this is why the project-based learning approach is really um, compelling. Uh, you know, Alan talked about uh, students getting involved in games and challenges and, and being willing to devote, uh, you know, hours and hours. And at the Air Force Academy and, and uh, other service academies, frankly, um, the cyber challenges are hard for us because our students can't soak like they do at Carnegie Mellon. A, a student can't just shut uh, her room and stay there for a week, you know, figuring out a problem because we make them, you know, work out. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Play basketball and stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's that, it, it's those uh, bright um, students who are interested in anything. And, uh, you know, the, the skills can come. Uh, the, the individual skills, but, but it's it, the potential. It, it, it it's is the hard. potential you have to Yes, it's hard to teach the potential mm -hmm. once they're as old well, as uh, our students are. Okay, we're going to go into the next area that we're talking about, which you guys have almost kind of touched on a little bit, and it has to do with us, with our ability to use and to cultivate talent. So you've talked about the sorts of people who are out there who are interested in, and then think about, you know, we talked about the process of them coming on board with us, which is difficult. But if the, the you know, characteristic a person that we're looking for is, you know, an introvert, nonconformist, um, and we're bringing them into our environment. I guess I'm looking for: uh, does our environment need to change, or do we have the sort of environment that can nurture them? And I want to aim this question at you, Tim, because you talked about you have a workforce of most of people who are average age or is less than 25, and I think a lot of those are military. Is that correct? It is. Yeah. Uh, so I've heard of policy changes and discussion about more policy changes in the future where we're going to open the aperture for the types of people we want to bring in as military, uniformed military um, personnel. And it seems like that's like going for the widest maximum number of people and then shoving them into the narrowest, most restrictive um, career path that we have. So from you, do we have uh, the environment that we need? Um, do, is there something that we, uh, 
need to provide in our environment, or do we have the right environment for this talent to prosper? So I think that's a really good question. Um, sometimes I know that uh, we want to be drawn into a conversation a bit of, uh, as if it is a fight, but I don't know that it needs to be. Um, I do think that uh, we would all observe broadly that the military culture and institutions inside the United States as part of the Department of Defense, as part of the executive branch and so on, has been able to adapt and change over time uh, to meet um, circumstance uh, and changes in the environment. Sometimes the Department of Defense has been able to lead turn those changes because of the critical and analytic and innovative thinking and deep strategic thought uh, in thinking about the future. You know, as a, as a military uniform force, we spend a lot of time building plans and contemplating alternative futures. Uh, and one of those certainly has to do with manpower, but it also has to do with the skilled force that we need in the composition. But it also has to do with the environment that we think we'll confront, whether it's in 2025 or 2045 and mm -hmm. so on. Um, so I think that the, the DOD and its culture um, can change and has changed and has demonstrated the kind of resiliency uh, and also agility to do so. I think I would also observe, you know, some my own personal view. Um, you know, when I went uh, to my first conflict zone in the early 90s, um, that was almost an entirely uniform force combination of boots on the ground uh, and sailors on ships. Um, the past uh, 15 years have revealed that uh, it's a national effort. Uh, and industry is there, contractors are there, civilians are there from across government. Uh, absolutely, uh, uniforms are there present in the fight. We also do an awful lot of reach back support. So I don't know that we have to bin ourselves into thinking that in order to be a cyber operator uh, and to be interested in national security for the nation, that you can only do that from or in a uniform. Um, I think the department benefits from the relationships that it has with industry, academia, and so on. Now, there are probably some challenges uh, on what I guess I would refer as the HR process. Um, mm -hmm. And it does feel at times that we sometimes lag in that regard and that we're in a bit of a chase uh, for the competition. And so uh, where we can be bold, uh, and there's a lot of thinking I'm aware of, you know, based on interactions I have with peers of mine in all the services that, uh, you know, how do you uh, retain talent? And it's uh, some very interesting options to do that. Um, we spend a fair bit of effort on educating, um, you know, the officer corps. We're spending more time in seeing value in educating senior NCOs and so on. Mm -hmm. But across uh, that gamut, it's not just education. We do an awful lot of training, right? Uh, and there uh, is probably an opportunity where we can be a little bit more innovative and creative, where that's, uh, you know, what CyberCom would call a persistent cyber training environment mm -hmm. uh, and other mechanisms. Right now, uh, U.S. CyberCom is hosting a CyberGuard, and they'll go into a cyber flag series as part of a, a training enterprise across the Department of Defense. Um, so interactions with Guard and Reserves and state governors and, uh, and local industry is uh, a, a deep opportunity. I, I was struck by the notion that the competition isn't necessarily Silicon Valley. Um, I think that you're right, and I think mm -hmm. that uh, I, I would almost observe that this is probably the first time that I've actually kind of clarified the thought on that. Clearly, talent goes there, and that's a good thing. Um, but more and more, it seems that, that that tends to seem to be on the cutting edge. Mm -hmm. um, and what we need is uh, talent that helps us do the resiliency, sustainment, mm -hmm. you know, day-to-day -day edge. And um, mm -hmm. I'll have to think about that a little bit. Um, in the end, I think we do need an enduring process. Um, and it can't be static, right, because the environment is not static. Um, but we also need something that looks like a pipeline. Uh, inside my force, I think the things that Jeff was talking about, you know, we sort of get who we get. They come to us because they have a call to serve, um, but they remain with us because they're excellent, they're excellent at their task, we recognize that, and we, we provide for them opportunities to, to be innovative, um, you know, to be sort of, uh, we can be accepting of the nonconformist or the maverick, you know. Our history, um, you know, reveals that. I started uh, on a battleship, uh, and that ship was effectively rendered uh, ineffective by, you know, some, what would be a future Air Force General Officer in the 1920s, so oh, thanks for yes, that. Oh, yes, that one. <laughs> so uh, we can change, and we need to. I, uh, I, 
you know, I, I think this, uh, this notion of uh, Silicon Valley versus other places as competition is an interesting one for us to, to um, think more about. Um, so we used to be an Air Force that could tell a uh, lieutenant colonel, go off and figure out how to bomb Tokyo. And then four months later, the, the answer would come. Uh, you know, the, the amount of paperwork to take an Air Force bomber off from a Navy carrier uh, today, the, the level of approvals, you know, and, right. and so, you know, this notion that, that creativity and the, and the ability to be agile and a lot of the agility within our core missions comes from uh, cyber, you know, comes from the ability to use information dominance, to use information differently, slow down the enemy's ability to make decisions quickly so that your decision making is faster than the enemy's. Um, and, you know, so, so moving toward, you know, I think part of the answer is moving toward a DevOps culture, at least in cyber, where it's not a, an acquisition process that we expect to take, um, you know, decades or years, but instead it's a continuous um, understanding of how cyber is interacting with the core missions in a sort of LVC, and, and I would add gaming, uh, LVCG uh, type environment, so that we can try things, we can enable c creativity, we can you know, move a slider back and forth to go back in time, forward in time, and to, to simulate what we think might happen if we do something, to try it virtually, and then if it works, uh, do it, and then if not, we scrub back and, and try again. So, so enabling people to be innovative and, creati and creative I think is part of um, our obligation to the future. Uh, well, along those lines, the, back to TJ, um, question about do they, are they in uniform or not? I think one of the questions is should the, Sarah asked this question, should the military train these people or should we as uniform people? And I think if you buy the idea that this is a Sputnik moment where we are finally realizing that Last week, Russia put out 60,000 new graduates who had cyber foundations and have been doing that in a program that started in 85, but for at least 12 years. And we put out a very, very small number. The only solution is the same solution we used in World War II for pilots, which is the military needs to train the pilots because the other guys aren't going to do it at the scale that we need to have them done. And if they're going to do it, um, I, the persistent training environment idea is, is brilliant. But you've already done more than anybody. When uh, Mike Basla and Earl Matthews were running cyber, they ran cover for something down at Hurlburt, which is a, a, a simulator. People call it a range, but I think it's more of a simulator, more like the pilots, where the, the kids can come in, they can crash the plane, they learn new things, they have courses in it, and they don't get out of the course unless they, they fly the plane safely. And I think the coolest thing that, that um, General Lynn did when he was at Fort Gordon was instead of saying, oh, we need to build one of those, which is what all his contractors wanted to do, he said, let's go use the stuff that the Air Force did, make it better, we can share missions. We can, I mean, I think you guys have done enormous success that, that other, nobody else has done. So I, I think if we take this idea that it is a Sputnik moment, that we actually need to change the game, then you're the only game in town that can do it at scale, and, uh, and, and you're already moving in the right direction. I, I need to jump on that. Uh, Alan's right. The Sputnik moment better be here. Hopefully it was here already. But until we as a society stop talking about how important this is and start acting as if it's that important, we are not going to get to this answer. So if the Sputnik moment is here with that latest news, then we've got to get serious about putting money behind it and being able to scale up to provide that kind of training as well as the education piece. So I am really glad you, you said that, Alan. I would also like to suggest that we're not in a competition for this talent. We need to change our attitude and stop thinking that we are competing with infrastructure or Silicon Valley for this talent. We've got to look at this as a shared resource and recognize that this generation that is filling our, our ranks right now and the generations behind them, 
they want to have flexibility in where they work, not just in the way they think. So we really need to change our internal structures so that they have an opportunity to have a more permeable line between working for the government and working for private sector. We need to have different opportunities for people to come into the military for a short period of time, move out of it, come back in without having lost the uh, positions that they've gained or the seniority that they've gained. We need to be looking at new and novel approaches for how we can do almost job sharing or, or our sharing, if you will, uh, to be able to have someone working for the private sector, and maybe that's where they're getting their big paycheck, but also spending 25, 40% of their time working for the government too. And figure out how we deal with this, this sharp line that we've got right now that says if you're a contractor, you can't speak for the government, you can't take certain actions for the government, and even though many commands and organizations are successful at making contractors part of their team and not second-class citizens, the rules and regulations still drive it that way. We've got to get past this. Okay, I have to jump in. I have to jump in. We are, we, we are at our Sputnik moment, I would say. But I, w I would also say that there's a lot, or uh, there's a, a group of us that have been working on this, hoping that everybody would arrive here, okay? And, and you've arrived here, which is great. So there are pieces of legislation that have already passed that are going to enable this. It's what the federal government now does with does this, with, with your policies yes. and procedures, okay? Because we've kind of paved the path, and Congress gets it, that they need to do something, but we've also kind of worked with them and said, don't get overly prescriptive in this area about things. So things, like two years ago, the whole idea of using competitions, because the government thinks like you have to have a four-year degree and you have to have so much work experience and all this other stuff, that competitions could actually um, substitute for work experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was passed. Um, two years ago, and now you're working on the regulations of how to implement that, but then you're going to have to have a way to measure it. So that's why we were doing stuff in this area. The other thing that's happening right now is, is this whole idea of exactly what you said, Janice, and DOD is supposed to look at this because the governors really want to keep their own workforce, right? They want to have their own cyber warriors to be able to do stuff. So through the NDAA last year, I believe, you are supposed to start looking at, um, can you do something along the lines of a National Guard approach, but through cybersecurity? So when I first started out a lot of my comments, I said there's short-term issues, which you were saying, okay, I hope we don't get focused just on today. Well, we do have to be focused on today because we have to defend. Then there's midterm issues about, well, how do we do stuff about the pipeline and education and those things? And then there's longer term issues, you know, everything that we've been talking about today. And longer term issues of the strategic view that um, DOD normally takes about how do we defend our country in the future and those leadership capabilities that you're developing. The things that we see on the ground on these teams are they're not the most successful teams that do well in these competitions aren't ones that are solely mixed of technical skills, that they're all technical skills, that there's a recognition, like the, the very first year we ran this, it was a lawyer, a business major, a communications person, and a technical person from computer science. Okay, because they looked at the world very differently. And so I think that's really what we're talking about up here, and that you're building all of these solutions in flight. And we can't really lose sight of that, which I am going to give DOD a big and the academies a big can, because they're the ones who started all these competitions in the first place that then rolled out. And so they recognized it almost 15, 20 years ago in the cyber world that they had to do stuff, and they started working on the competitions and DARPA and those things rolled them out. And so it's taken that long to get it into mainstream. So a lot of the solutions are going to come from DOD. So okay. I agree with much of what you said, Karen, but I don't think we are truly at our Sputnik moment unless we see the reaction from the whole of government and whole of society to take advantage of those levers that you've put in place. Okay. All right. I know Admiral White wants to say something real quick. Go ahead. Yeah, so just uh, two quick follow-ups. I think the issue is principally in the onboarding. You know, this idea yeah. that you have to have a degree or you have to have a qualification or you have to have 
the great value that we see that I benefit from is, you know, I get who I get through whatever the onboarding process is, but within the teams, once they arrive, their ability to innovate and challenge each other, it's a very dynamic, very flexible way, and that's how we see and identify our talent that rises to the top. The last thing I would just say, in the context of the uniformed military, there are a couple things that uh, are pretty important about them. One of them um, is that, uh, you know, in the national security business, you do have uniformed military to, to do a couple of particular things on behalf of the nation, mm -hmm. and we would typically say that those are governed by the law of armed conflict. So when you talk about operators on keyboards, that does mean something in our context, mm -hmm. right. um, and we can't lose sight of that. Okay, one more question from me and then we'll take some from the audience. Um, we'll see if we can go through this last one pretty quick. So let's think about long-term development or career growth. What is the end state? Uh, and Alan, I'm gonna ask you this first. What's the end state of a, a well-developed cyber professional? What are we trying to get to? So I, there are tens of thousands of cyber professionals. The place that there is a radical shortage is not the people who, well, it's the people who can reverse engineer the command and control system and figure out that a lot of our ships have a problem right now, um, or who can, who can take the satellite system, figure it out, and then put a defense in place. That's where the shortage is. There are two separate studies, uh, one uh, Frank DiGiannini and, and then um, an NSA study that both came out with the same number oddly, completely independently, which is the United States has about a thousand of those people, and you can find them. They're, we have about a thousand. Um, we need, that there are three different numbers that have been talked about. 10,000, 20,000, or 30,000 is the minimum number if we get into armed conflict and cyber is part of it, because we'll be hit in so many places that that small number of people cannot respond across multiple places. The, the, the Brits have found just the, a massive breakthrough, stupid idea, we knew it here, but we didn't really understand it. They built a, a, a test that figures out whether or not you are likely to succeed at this. And it isn't a skills test, which always swamps most of the other tests. It's actually a psychometric test that watches how your brain attacks problems and measures time at task and task order and has, they've gone through 30,000 people and then they've tested the results in classes to find out whether their they're testing, whether their testing actually results in, in their more advanced classes. Very successful, but what was fascinating, and this is the, I think the, the main reason I'm, I'm feeling good about the future, is that they had, they separated people into four quadrants. Those with high psychometric skills and low psychometric skills, those with a lot of experience, they might have gotten it themselves or in class, and those with almost no experience. So upper left is, is good psychometrics, no experience. Upper right is good psychometrics, lots of experience. Those are the people, the top 10%, who succeed in every class we've ever taught. They're just amazing, and we think, why aren't there more? And the answer is because the guys in the upper left are more numerous, and they hit a wall. Alan Parrish, the Naval Academy, described it. They hit a wall because we try to teach them cybersecurity, like secure coding, and they can talk about it, but if they've never written a computer program, they have nothing that they can do with it. So we make it a survey course. And what the Brits found was if you pick those upper left people, high psychometrics, no skills, and you give them about five fundamentals that enable them to learn cybersecurity. So basic programming, basic Linux, basic Windows, how the computer works, how networks work, TCP IP, so that when they get to cyber, it's familiar. They actually are not as good as the guys in the upper right, but they're good enough so that we can take the guys in the upper right and shoot them into those, those high-end jobs. So I think the people we are, are, are Fit for task people are not the people who can talk about it, they're very important, but in, in war I'd really rather have the guy who can take that weapon that comes at us, turn it around and send it back, not the guy who says we ought to be able to do that. So <laughs> it, it's time, I think, to figure out a way to go from 1,000 to 10,000 or 20,000 and bring the rest of them up, and I think the Brits actually have a pathway there that we, we might be able to try. Okay, lightning. So I'll, I'll jump on that and I will say that you are exactly right, Alan. One of the underpinnings of the curriculum that we have pushed out at the 0506 GS14, GS15 
level that gives JPME 2 credit is that absolutely every member of that cohort must have an understanding of the implications of operating from a man-made terrain. And that includes both the limitations of operating from it and the opportunities that it generates for you. And if you don't have some basic blocking and tackling understanding of what's going on, you won't get it. So that's one of the things we're targeting within that curriculum. But we also feel that we need to be exploring some other really high-end long-term career for every senior government official, every senior general and flag officer to get that same kind of basic understanding of the blocking and tackling. I once heard a cohort member from my capstone class, so this is dated a little bit, but he made the comment that, well, gee, if we're getting all of these attacks from country X, why don't we just schwack them back? You know, to me, there, there's a level of naivete in that kind of a, a claim that could get us into a hell of a lot of trouble. And the really unfortunate thing is that even though that was back in 2008, I heard almost exactly the same comment from a senior leader just about two weeks ago. So while we're doing a better job, I think, really developing that, those mid-grade to senior grade officers that are ready to make that, that leap, we still have a lot of senior folks out there who have missed out on this kind of development at the top end of their career development, and we need to get at that. Right, so I, I think unleashing that talent of the, you know, making ourselves a flatter organization where we realize a 19-year-old may have the right answer and we need to enable her to get that answer mm -hmm. uh, be the, the, the plan. Um, Karen was talking earlier about identifying talent um, and skills and uh, we did a sprint on a 21st century training model for talent and that was one of the key findings that our, our current HR systems are not designed to allow commanders to say what talents they really mm -hmm. value. They're not designed to allow um, personnel to uh, f figure out quickly how to go um, uh, get those talents. Um, and, the, and they're certainly in the cyber realm, you know, not, not designed in a way that we could do using a data-based approach, which sounds like uh, um, you've got your finger on. Yeah, so, and that's what we're trying uh, that, to bridge. It, yeah. You know, that, that ability for private industry to contribute in a, in a marketplace of some sort um, ways of doing training rather than thinking that the government has to right. build it all and um, that, that uh, is a great way forward, I think. Okay, so shall we go, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am, we have quite a few questions that have been coming okay. through. All right, so choose your favorite. Bear with us for a moment. The first one is actually a two-part question. Okay. The first part is actually directed to Admiral Hamby. Are you trying to get a College of Information and Cyberspace Certificate recognized as DODI 8570 IAM3 cert? And then for the panel as a follow-up, what baseline or foundational training would you recommend other than 8570 requirements considering the numerous industry cybersecurity software packages available? So the short answer for you from me is no, we're not. Mm -hmm. We are not the college that is generating that effect. We are the college whose students, some of our students, should be coming to us with that certificate already in their back pocket. We're, the, we're, we're those folks who are going to be the O6s and GS15s, the SESs, the generals and flag officers, the strategic thinkers that develop our strategy for approaching this, that are going to be looking at how do we solve some of the challenges that we were talking about here today? How do we drive through changes in the HR system so we don't have a standardized PD that everyone must meet when you can see the perfect guy or gal right in front of you, but they don't directly comport to it and we can't hire them? So those are the folks that we are educating. And a note I said some of our folks need to come with that cert in their back pocket. We need, as Karen pointed out, a lot of those folks who are coming from other walks of life, other domains and other experiences, because without that synergy of thought, we are going to underachieve as a nation in this domain, and our leadership needs to have that hybridization and that, that crosstalk so that they can generate enough 
of an understanding of how the platform is going to be employed for society and not just employing it for its own sake. Who wants the second part of the question? I think it was for the whole panel. We don't have time to go through the whole panel. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll jump oh. in because um, I, Alan runs a certification program and I do not. So I, and I have a problem with 8570 and I've written a report on this. It's the Center for Strategic International Studies and I don't think that 8570 is trying to, does accomplish the outcome that DOD really wants. Okay, and so um, certifications are great. Um, just because you have a certification doesn't necessarily mean that you can do the job. And that's part of what the challenge is with the certification. So I don't want to say one is better than the other. What I can say is that the U.S. Cyber Challenge is trying to work with certification people and bodies. So ISC squared obviously is the predominant one out there. And trying to get them to change how they do their testing. Because you're never going to change the whole HR process going through. And people mm -hmm. are key to looking for certifications, right? So then that means the certification has to change to be more meaningful so that when you hire them or you identify them, that you can rely on what that certification is saying. And so that is what I would term one of the midterm issues that we have to work through with all the certifying bodies. Um, so that, and I know DHS has a big team and there's all of them sit at the table and they're all talking about it. But until we bring this world together of learning and applied and putting them together. I'm a science major, so I love labs, and that's what we're talking about. You know, this is the same thing in the medical profession. I want the dentist who actually filled a tooth, not the one who can talk about it. And that's what, that's what they do. They actually have to demonstrate it before they get a license. And so we're talking about that, but that's more of a midterm, long term about how those certifications are gonna evolve. Thank you. Oh, what, what's the next question? Thank you. This will be the final question. Due to how defenders are used, defined missions only, is underutilization and boredom a retention problem? And if so, how do you address that challenge? Real quick, TJ's persistent range, you know, <laughs> trained to fight, right? Um, my force is not bored. Uh, they got plenty to do. They are adept and good at it. Um, they challenge themselves to get better and improve every day. Um, we are trying to make uh, operating and defending a network simply not static. Mm -hmm. It's very dynamic, a teaming concept. You know, we don't only just defend in the Department of Defense, right? There is a full spectrum and continuum of capabilities that we always have to stand ready to do. And the most effective uh, fighting forces do not do just one thing. Uh, if you're on a mission on a ship or flying a plane, you have to do your full mission profile, and it is never just defense. Okay. Okay. Anybody else want? Um, I, I I would also say that you know that um, shifting and and you know in the in the joint pub gover governing cyber um, there there is uh, a, a reason that all three lines of cyber operation are intertwined. Uh, you know between Doden Ops, DCO, OCO. The, those need to stay close together, and, and at least in the Air Force, you know, shifting from this idea that we can build castle walls and our, you know, defense. Doden mm -hmm. operators then go defend it to an active defense of Air Force missions. Uh, we call that the, the Cyber Squadron Initiative. So mm -hmm. changing our comm squadrons over to cyber squadrons where that active defense of what's going on at a wing is, is critical and, and I think um, helps overcome board and although <laughs> like the Admiral, I don't detect much boredom out there. Okay, good. All right. I want to thank the panel. Obviously, we are getting the hook. Um, so uh, thank you very much for coming out and sharing your thoughts on these, the, this area of uh, talent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lieutenant General Bob Wood. I uh, really want to thank the panel. Uh, as we put this panel together, knowing how tough the topic was, uh, we really tried to put the, the diversity of thoughts and experiences together. We do this a lot. FCA runs quite a few events and quite a few panels. Once in a while, magic happens. And we really want to thank you for the perspectives you shared with this audience. You all are the lucky ones, and you stayed long to get there. But we really want to thank you for you being here and for the audience 
sticking with us. I think this really revealed some new perspectives and new thinking. We have time after this. Perhaps the panel members might have time to answer more questions. We're sorry we didn't get quite, quite as many to you. We have them all recorded. Any of you want to have the list, we're happy to show you what the, uh, what the in audience was interested in. On behalf of AFCA and on behalf of the panel, we will make a presentation in your name to uh, the Fisher House. We thank you for that. I just have a, a couple of concluding remarks before we all break uh, and move on to the floor. We're going to move to another networking break. Uh, that'll be on the floor with luncheon being served at 1 o'clock. Dr. Zangardi will be here for the presentation. Uh, as a reminder, today's luncheon is the final opportunity to sit and engage with senior leaders. That will be in the uh, tables and noted on the back as you come in. The, the seating chart will allow you to have a chance to sit and speak with the senior leaders. And we'll conclude again at the end of the conference with a Meet the Seniors event and a speed dating event with small business from DISA. We think we've still got uh, some airspeed and altitude and good work for, to be done. Once again, let's give this panel a, a hand for a great job. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you out on the floor back and then back here at 1 for lunch. Thank you.